my name is Jill Matson, and I have spent my life studying antiquity, the ancient mystery schools, and I just love sound and music, so that's definitely my passion. And I have gone throughout the ages, and I've gone throughout the Ascended Master teachings throughout the ages, and they each have sound and music ideas and techniques to heal ourselves on like every way possible and in fact in ways that we don't even think that sound could possibly do. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start way back in history and I'm going to start with Lemuria and Atlantis and some channeled sources on how they used sound and then after those epics I'll go into um, history history where there's written records and I will just um, talk about different ways to use sound to heal. I have books and CDs demonstrating some of the techniques and just another area of little housekeeping. Um, I have gone around and tried to ask most of you if anybody had any questions. So I might try to make a few little detours for people's questions that they've asked me prior to us starting so I can include those. And I'm kindly going to get given a 10 minute warning so that I can uh, zip it up and uh, leave it open for questions. Okay? All right? Okay. I'm going to start with the writings, the channeled writings about how sound was used in ancient Lemuria. The information that I've read says that um, they must have been less physical than we. They must have been more a spiritual being um, they listen to tones that the smallest interval would be nine of our notes apart. So bum bum is like one of the smallest notes they would listen to. Which means they'd only have two or three notes within their hearing range. So they had to have been using clairaudience. Um, I would suggest that these are highly evolved beings and they're using sound to connect with the divine and their intervals between their tones, as a rule, are um, nine of our tones apart. And that's as small as it gets. They use sound for like, if you have an amputated leg, for regenerating it. And one of the important things that they consider in sound, and this is really kind of funky, I, you wouldn't think of it, is the position of the musician. For example, if you notice, like in the Old Testament, they would be using some of this old technique when they're tumbling the walls of Jericho in the Old Testament. And if you notice, they had to make certain towns, use certain instruments, which creates certain harmonics, and they had to march around in certain orders, and they had a certain rhythm pattern. So one of the things that counts with the old, old music is the actual angle or the spin of the music. Like, for example, if they're going to try to heal someone, they're going to make sacred geometry sounds, shapes, and put the person to be healed in the middle. And then they're going to have the different toners or the different sounds hit them at different angles. So they're actually using math, angular math of the tones, to do the healing. And I was lucky enough to find a video, it was a crummy quality video, but the content was good. From like the 1950s, there was a man, I'm just blanking on his name, but he had seen the Tibetan monks raise great big boulders up a cliff. And he actually video, uh, filmed it, I would say. And what he showed the diagrams of the different shapes. They did sacred geometry. They had maybe 80 musicians. They carefully crafted which instruments, rhythms, tones, pitches, but one of the most important things was the shape at which each person stood and the angle at which they hit the rock that then went up the hill. The ancient um, people in Egypt and many of the other places, some sources credit the lifting of heavy um, blocks with sound and the ease of that. And if you look at it, the um, pre-history, pre and all of the stone structures, you see these huge stone structures and we kind of marvel at how did they move those stones. So when you get into the Atlantean period, their music is a little bit different. They channel that they were connecting with like um, the planetary director or maybe um, a little bit less higher than God. 
their musical um, tones become closer together so that their hearing range, or clear audience hearing range, is, is narrowing a little bit. Their smallest intervals are seven notes apart. And again, they're using music for the same thing. They're using music to um, regenerate the body. They're also changing their sounds depending on whether you're right or left brained because the brains process frequencies differently in each hemisphere. Okay, since I don't have a lot of time, I'm going to move on. I am going to go to the ancient Persians. This would be like the Zoroastrians or um, the Babylonians. We're talking 4,000 years before Christ, the end of the Ice Age. And speaking of the Ice Age, when you look at the, um, some of the earliest findings from the Ice Age, where they did music, there's blobs in these caves in France, and they're all the points that the harmonics hit the cave. So they were able to break down the harmonic scale and even identify where it hit in certain points of the room. Pretty advanced. Um, okay, the Persians, the Zoroastrians. The Zoroastrians had a music system based on the number six. And that's kind of a magical number in music because um, music is a spiral. Music is math in many ways. You can convert the cycles per second to math. You convert a rhythm pattern, 3-4, three, 3-5, three, to math. You can convert harmonics to math. Harmonics is like when you make a tone, there's a little after ripple. And the way in which the sounds or the pitches occur in that after ripple goes according to a mathematical formula. Um, so there's many ways that you can use math. We just saw how the ancient people used to use math and where the musicians stood and what angle, or kind of like vector math they were using, what angle the sound came in at. So with the math, um, the, the neat thing about the Persian system was that they were using tones that were, if you raised them up op octaves, they would be complementary colors. And so I'm going to go back a little bit. I'm going to talk about frequencies and vibrational vibrations. If you take like a sound of a music, of the musical scale, and you take it up octaves, eventually you'll get to the frequencies per second of light. So you can take our standard color chart and apply it to the musical scale. Um, Pythagoras did this, the Egyptians did this, the ancient Chinese did this. For example, red is the note of C. And as you go on this spectrum, you will also go through different octaves. When you come up with the frequencies of your bones and your tissues, which all have a resonant frequency, they're all octaves of certain sounds, as well as your emotions. Love always feels like love, and anger always feels like anger. That's because it's a very precise frequency. And there's going to be an octave of a color and of a sound. That's why we say she was red with anger or green with envy. And if you keep going up, you can even get to brain waves. So you can correlate various thoughts with various tones and various pitches and various colors. And I think we'd understand brain waves better. Instead, they have like alpha, beta, data in the science books on a straight line. I think they put that in a circle. It's so much easier to understand what's going on. Anyway, as you do this, um, one other thing is that there's a scientific phenomenon called octave resonance. And it's, it's really simple. It's like if you have a violin here and I pluck one tone, the violin will sound, uh, the second violin will sound that tone. And you don't have to pluck it. It's science, it's repeatable, it happens every time. It's called octave resonance. And what it means, in essence, is that if you have one tone here, mm, mm, and you have an octave here, there's a transfer of energy. So for me, trying to keep it simple, I always try to think of like wormholes or gerbil tun tunnels going between octaves. So like, there's a correlation then between the color red, anger, a certain frequency, the letter C, and also it'll be certain tendons, muscles, ligaments. So it's kind of like anything that's got an octave um, transfers energy. Okay, so now that I explained that, as you can see, the colors then fit in a musical scale. So like red, if we go through the rainbow, Roy G. Biv, you can put that on a circle as a color wheel, 
and you can assign um, like our musical scale which has 12 half notes to it. And the thing is that when you look at the math of any two colors or any two notes right across the color chart, so if you have a complementary color, the frequencies cancel each other out. Like if you've heard of noise canceling on some of the Alexis cars, you know, all they're doing is they're taking a frequency, let's say it's 10, they're multiplying it by a frequency that's 1 over 10, and they cancel out. That is also the math of Royal Rife's frequency, the Rife machines. That's the, that's the whole basis of that. They're using that math. So anyway, the thing that's neat is um, complementary colors always cancel each other out. And that's really kind of nice because a complementary color can often be an antidote. Like if you have a virus and it's 10, if you want to get rid of that virus, you listen to 1 over 10. So the complementary color or the antidote frequency is very powerful indeed. It equates to um, uh, in between a minor and a major six apart. So the music of the um, Zoroastrians, the ancient Babylonians, um, they were very much into like royal rife machines. They were using the complementary colors to get rid of undesirable emotional states, mental states, and physical illnesses. Fascinating, I think. So then you go into um, the ancient Chinese. The ancient Chinese were talking mm, 3,000 years prior to Christ. They are very much into astrology, and in fact, um, the original Zoroastrian, he predicted like astrological events two and three hundred years ahead of time. These guys had no telescopes. These people in antiquity are very good with the stars. They were also very aware of how this subtle energy comes in and changes us. You can buy off a of Motorola for $9.99 the frequencies of the day that um, they just pick up on their satellite. And let's say a frequency of zinc, because everything has a frequency, if zinc comes in, everybody's cold gets a little better that day. It's a good day. Or sometimes something comes in that it might challenge you and it's a bad day. So what the ancient Chinese were doing is that they were observing how the stars move and you imagine that each, each body in motion makes a very slight wave that comes in that we now can record and they were using the noise canceling stuff to balance out the challenges. I just think that's fascinating. I put that in my Stardust CD. I also put in for all of the planets and the sun in our system and the moon. And I also put in the frequencies for carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen because they were very much into balancing of the spirit and um, they did that by balancing the elements. The idea is not to so much balance the elements. It's more that the elements are symbolic of different types of frequencies that have different harmonic patterns, different rhythms, different pitches. And that whatever's in the elements, that type of energy is in you. So if you balance the elemental energies, it's a complete total balancing, aligning with spirit. So I put that one in there. Um, then I'm going to go to the ancient Hindu. And the ancient Indians, they were um, rose to power about, oh, I forgot one thing very important about the Chinese, I'm sorry. Their musical system's based on fives. Their scale, every note is created by a fifth apart. And now they might compose them down into one octave, but everything in their musical system, even the number of elements, it all revolves around the number five. The ancient Hindu, oh, and they, here's another thing that's interesting that someone asked a question about, a little detour. The ancient um, Chinese used to tune to the note F. They had a practice with music that we would think is Lulu. They, they'd sit there and listen to one tone for like an hour, like, duh. Kind of like listen to your refrigerator buzz or something. And uh, this was high metaphysical stuff. And they, um, what they were doing is that they were tuning what vibrations people harmonized with 
and how they thought because that particular frequency that they picked has motions and has thoughts. So they police their people by policing the music. They picked their harmony and they, it, was, um, it was a crime to use the wrong tones. The manner in which they did that was that all instruments, they would regulate the measurement of the size. So if you had a flute, or they had different names, but you had some instrument that was the wrong size, shh, couldn't use it. Because they were controlling their people's emotions and thoughts, providing peace, harmony, and balance with astrology and these tuning pitches. And everybody, every part of their segment had responsibility for some note. And that they would sit and meditate for hours and hours and hours and hours, just one note, one note. And interestingly, it's an F, which correlates with the frequency of a platonic year in, in this cosmos. And it also um, correlates with green. At the same time, the complementary color, or the frequency of C, is being featured in, in India with the Buddhism and the Hinduism. And um, they are chanting to answer your question. They're doing chanting. The idea with chanting is, again, if an emotion is a, is a specific frequency. So let's say you want more joy. They'll come up with the frequency of joy, the rhythm of joy. The vowel sounds, vowel sounds in your mouth create harmonics. Different harmonics correspond to different things in your body. It's, again, it's math. So their mantras that they gave their devotees, I think this was your question, they're based on um, different harmonics, pitches, rhythms, and the person's age, and geography, all those kinds of things. And the idea, of, like if you have the frequency of joy, and you pretend you're a big bucket, and then every time you sing the mantra, you drop a bucket of, uh, one drop of joy inside you. And then when you get angry and pissed off, you could take one out. But, uh, <laughs> so the idea is to sing it more than you get angry. And <laughs> eventually you become joy because you fill up. So that's the Hindus. Um, both these ancient systems have anywhere from 22 to like 88 notes within an octave. We have 12. These ancient civilizations and these two civilizations are um, meditating to sounds and tuning into tiny, tiny, subtle vibrations that, quite frankly, most people don't even hear today. They also, octaves of frequencies will correlate to brainwave and states of consciousness that produce psychic phenomena. These were also people that had... Um, much more seeing ability, meta, you know, they were big, better seers, they were um, better in the psychic stuff than we. I believe a lot of that had to do to meditating, tuning to very minute frequencies, becoming more and more aware of little tiny frequency differences. And if you listen to them enough, then you can recreate it and match it to consciousness. So there's your Hindu. Um, and then, let me see what's next. Um, I did this guy. Okay. The ancient Egyptians, um, they had a fabulous music system based on the numbers 3, 4, and 5. They were very much into sacred geometry. All of their buildings are the numerical um, equivalents of different types of sacred geometry shapes. Um, and they give you a certain feeling. And most of your sacred sites, you will find are harmonic portions. They're either the tones of the chakras or they're tones of harmonics. So they, they amplify um, tonal patterns in your body when you walk into the building. Um, I, I mean, I could just spend a day on the Egyptian stuff. I think I'm just going to move on to the Greek because we have so little time. The ancient Greek... Um, they had a music system based on fours. And I hope you get the pattern now. We've gone for nine, seven, six, five, four. They had these things called tetrachords. And I tell you, I must not be very smart because it took me years to figure this one out. I kept thinking tetrachord, four, but I'm thinking of chords. Today, a chord is a one, three, five pattern. Bum, bum, bum. Not so in history. That would have sounded terrible to them. They had a different consciousness. They had different strengths. 
and different sounds sounded good. They write the sound of a third, which we find lovely, is kind of like scratching your fingernails on the blackboard. So they're tuning to different notes, they're creating different emotions, they create a different consciousness in that society. So the ancient Greeks were into um, sacred geometry and putting it in their music. You know how you read um, Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code and he was really big on explaining the, the five-pointed star, that, okay? Well, that is like, um, when you look at the math, it's phi within phi within phi, within, it's like a phi center, P-H-I, the 1.1618. And they created all of their tetrachords had phi in music, which is very close to a musical six, but you can calculate where phi occurs in music, and it was like each scale was a different pattern of placement of phi. And I believe they were relating to different emotional types. So they're now starting to tune to individuality, pers personalities. The names of the Greek scales, they're names after per people. You know how we say like a New Yorker, and we all know what a New Yorker is? When we think of someone from Japan, we all have an image of a personality traits. Well, all of their scales were like um, the Ionian, it's, it's a Greek isle. You know, the, uh, all their scales were names of people that had all those characteristics. So it's kind of like, I believe we're involving into matter. We're getting, spirit is getting more and more engrossed into matter. There's more and more duality occurring. We're more individual. There's less group consciousness, more individual consciousness really strengthened in the Greek music. The Greeks would use their sacred geometry patterns to spiral to God. So did the Hebrews in the Old Testament. And one of the things they did was that Fibonacci series of numbers that, you know, the spiral in the seashell, the spiral in the stars, the spiral in your body. It's math. It's music. And almost all music ever listened to in antiquity was based on that spiral. And so the idea is when you listen, it's kind of like a vibrational elevator to God or something, you know, and you kind of, I don't know. Lift, lift your whole vibrational body up. And, of course, we don't listen to that today. We stopped about 300 years ago. But um, I put those spirals in my Paint Your Soul CD. I also put in the Fibonacci numbers because the Fibonacci numbers, let me explain this. Let's say you have a seed of a plant and you have like a, a male and a female component in the seed. They each make a certain frequency because they're a vibration. So when you have two frequencies, it's science. It happens every time. They combine. So, and, and, you're, and they do the math. The frequencies, like if you have a high wave that overlaps with the low wave, they cancel out. Or if you have two high waves that overlap, they get twice as big. Okay, so it's science. So you got a little seed, it's starting to growing, it's making a frequency, the notes are combining. Until you get to a phi. A phi is simply a number that's irrational, goes on forever. You can never do the math because it's 1.6.18, never, never resolves. And so when that happens, as that plant grows, it branches off to the right. The other thing is that the phi branches off a little, it never quite is perfect phi, but it branches off a little under phi. And then you go up and the plant can do the math, the plant can do the math, and then you get a frequency where you can't do the math because it's an irrational number, so it goes off to the left. And so you get this branching and spiraling pattern. So what the ancients did, and this is an answer to a question that I got before I started, when they had to make a decision, or they felt their life, uh, a change coming, or they were trying to find their purpose or something, they would listen to a lot of these phi's. So they would kind of tune with this um, branching and spiraling um, pattern. It was one of their ways of, on a subconscious level, um, tuning in with their changes and the purpose of those changes. Okay, so I put that in my Paint Your Soul CD as well. Um, let me think where I'm going next. Um, okay, back to the Greeks. Um, the Greeks were into emotional healing. 
and they, they would do catharsis. They would um, provide different music as medicine. They did not go into so much the physical healing. They felt if they healed your emotions, then the physical healing would happen as a result. So a lot of their music, they would, um, they had, you know, like the plague was them. They, they would have dirges for the plague to get, they would have music per illness, which I told you how you could be done by just using the reciprocal. And they would um, have music for emotions and personal ailments. And they believed that you just can't build all kinds of good virtues. You have to get rid of your garbage. You have to kind of flush yourself, I suppose. And that all of us have been so hurt in our lifetimes. And when we don't acknowledge the pain, which is so easy to say, oh, that doesn't bother me. And then after a while, you don't want anybody close. And you, you, know, you, don't, want, you don't like someone who reminds you the person who hurt you last. And you just start to do this. Um, they would do catharsis. So they would use sad music or music that would remind them of emotional crap they wanted to leave out. And they would let the music do it. And I have this two CD um, where I'm using some of their techniques. It's what I did was um, I got excited about emotional healing because I believed that humankind needs emotional healing more than anything else. So this is, in my opinion, the, you know, the best blessing for this culture. And I went to the Bach flower remedies because that's a remedy that you, you take the remedy and it's the frequency of a flower. And the idea is like a rose feels different than a daisy. So if you're depressed, you would drink daisies. If you want to feel beautiful, you would take the rose. And so I have the vials of the frequencies of 12 vials. And um, I have to make an aside again. Um, in this particular book, I go into the science of sound in your body. This um, woman that I was um, lucky to study with, Sherry Edwards, um, discovered this system, and um, she has a lot of cool stuff on uh, nanovoice.org, free stuff. And um, <coughs> what she was able to do was she was able to break your voice out into component pitches. Kind of like you see a, a, a crystal and the sunlight comes in and then you see the component rainbow colors. It's the same thing. It's a software technique developed by a man called Joseph Fourier. Um, he's passed now, but anyway, it's, she has a free um, software program featuring that device. And, excuse me? Nanovoice.org. Yeah, and it's, it's a free, she'll, 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 you can download a device that will break your voice into component pitches. Doesn't work on Macs, just warn you. Only PCs. So anyway, um, she can find the frequency of anything. Like, you know, if you eat lunch, she can come up with, oh, here's the bologna and see it in your tummy. And she can, um, she can see like your digestion series, the Krebs cycle of digestion. It's the harmonic pattern, perfect. So it follows that math. And so if you, it's like a cascading. One note creates this, creates this, like a vibratory thing. So if you have one of these notes out, all of like dominoes fall and all the others past it are also going to be out. So you need to find the root one and tune it up. And she breaks your voice into component pitches and so she can find out exactly what's in your body and how to tune it. So like, you know, she can see like this is a pattern of a normal voice and you have all this stuff out of the normal pattern. All those are going to be illnesses and you can use that noise canceling thing and just like tune up your liver, your organ, your fight last night. <laughs> so it's really kind of cool. Anyway, um, I was getting on to these flower things. She um, showed me that she could, excuse me? What's her name? Sherry? Sherry Edwards. And there's a ton of sites and videos online for her. Great stuff. And this book is about her work. This book also in, it includes a bit about how she came up with this. Um, she has extraordinary healing, the science behind it, how it relates to math, emotions, um, astrology, color therapy. Um, and then the back part is ascended master techniques and how to use your voice, kind of like a magic wand, because you make sound in your voice. So how to use 
your sound box, your vibratory tool for targeted benefits. Okay. So anyway, you can, she did this for me. You know, we would play the frequency of niacin and my face would flush. I don't need to take any pill. You know, she can play a vitamin and then you can look in your body and find it. So I'm assuming you can listen to things. It's not just a matter of what we're eating, but it's a matter of what we're hearing and what we choose to focus on to listen to. And nature sounds are great for you next time you're out. Listen to the birdies with more intent. Okay, so um, given that um, um, t there's many ways to come up with the frequency, but I have the actual frequency of the vials in my flower symphonies that does the emotional healing. So it's the same as taking the vial, and then I use the Greek catharsis. So like, for example, you've been listening to them. These are the flower symphonies. It's like musically, I go into um, catharsis and then um, the buildup of the positive emotion. For example, we would have music that sounds a little impatient, and then you kind of clear, and then music that sounds patient. And my big joke is that my flower symphonies are not for pansies because um, when you are um, discharging, you know, you can feel it in your emotional body right about, right about here. So if you listen to the symphonies and the back part, the, if it bothers you a little, that's a good thing. And what, what I, I find, which is almost humiliating, is that I have an awful lot of crap. And I've been listening to them for years, and I'm still let go of stuff. And I never let go of the same stuff twice. Like one day, I will clear impatience. The next day, insincerity. Isn't that humiliating? And, um, you know, I don't know how that happens, but I guess your body clears when it wants to. And you, you've been listening to them. I chose them as a sample. Okay, Greek. Now I'm going to go into... The Middle Ages, and there was a request for this as well, um, to get more into the Middle Ages and what they did at that time. In the Middle Ages, they did like all the cultures before them, the government controlled the music. It was believed that th by controlling the vibratory structure, like the scaffolding of people's emotions and thoughts, that you controlled them. They weren't competing with cell phones, they weren't competing with... Um, TVs, no radios, you listen to what you were told to listen to, basically. And so they, they did have a, quite a stranglehold vibrationally on people. So when you come into the Middle Ages, the Catholic Church does this. And I know it's not a nice thing, but in their defense, everybody ahead of them also did the same little um, trick. Policed people with music. They used it for control. So... Um, the Catholic Church, if you can imagine that the beginning of its inception, you have Greek mystery, the Greek Empire falling, but it still had a tremendous allure with its magic and its hermetic magic. You have the Druids throughout Europe that are using probably Egyptian stuff or different mystery school stuff from Atlantis. You have the um, Babylonians and the people right across from the Greek Isles in the Middle Eastern area, the, the Zoroastrian stuff. And again, all of these cultures, they're all using music as one of their primary tools for their spiritual evolution because music is such a powerful influence. So, you can perhaps think of um, the Catholic Church looking at these religions as maybe your downtown business looks as a Walmart moving in. You know? <laughs> Pretty heavy-duty competition. So since the competition, religiously, used music, the Catholic Church almost outlawed it. In the beginning of the Middle Ages, um, if you were a musician, you weren't allowed to be buried on sacred ground. If you, were a, if you taught your daughter's music, it was considered um, um, basically teaching them the slippery slopes of hell. And not just musicians, but any artists, writers, composers, dancers, anything. All of that was like considered of the devil. The phi, the, the phi ratio for the branching and the spiraling um, and the patterns found in nature were considered, um, well, they're written as music diabolists. They're outlawed. Not allowed to use them. No phis, no Fibonacci numbers, nothing. 
Um, music was in the early part of the uh, Middle Ages, was limited to um, primarily one tone. It wouldn't sound like anything. The early Gregorian chants, they, w- they wouldn't sound, they're not our tonal system. They'd sound funky to us. Um, so there's no beginning, there's no end. And these poor, these poor guys, they would spend their whole life memorizing these, these chants with no melodies and these long things of words. And there's only a few loud. They're only heard during patterns of three, six, and nine. That's it. No other music. Um, and of course, the Dark Ages happened. Huh. We ban music. We get the Dark Ages. And, um, and things indeed were dark. Um, it was, as you know, very cruel, very vicious during that time period. The, um, as you progress towards the Dark Ages passes, you get into the Middle Ages and people are starting to develop things. There was a Benedictine monk, because I can't pronounce this, I just read it, I'm such a geek, but I don't know, Gizora, Giz, I don't know, Reza, Gizora, every time I read it, it's spelled differently as well. But anyway, this monk, about 1500, um, he makes the Solfeggio scale popular. And I don't know if any of you are into the Solfeggio tuning fork, so that particular scale it was encoded in the Old Testament, which is in my Paint Your Soul CD. Um, but according to the ancients, it is reported to have um, miraculous benefits. And I've seen um, before and after aura photos of just listening to these tones, and you see everybody's aura lights up. The middle tone tunes your DNA. It, when you look at the number pattern underneath the tones, if you use um, Pythagorean skein or the ancient method of transferring tones and music, it's basically a pattern of three, six, nine. Um, it's interesting because Tesla, who was a famous scientist in the 1920s, and he was doing, he invented like um, I think AC electric and so forth. He had um, reportedly all kinds of fabulous machines that you know could generate tremendous amounts of energy. He's quoted as saying many times, it's all from the power of music and three six nines. He didn't divulge his secrets. The scientist Kepler in 1600s did the same thing. He says it's all about energy sources, or all about pattern three six nines. The solfeggio that this Benedict monk come up is a, encoded in the Old Testament. It's a pattern of three six nines. And what's encoded in the Old Testament is six frequencies. But if you look at the math, it's not complete. There's actually 18. And I don't know how much time he has, so I don't know how much I'll get into it. But there's, there's kind of like solfeggio and re- reverse solfeggio. I believe they're for balancing. So um, they're really kind of cool. Um, then, um, okay, as you go through the, the, the Middle Ages, you get when um, the poor Catholic Church gets the butt kicked with Martin Luther. <laughs> And he is, um, he's in Germany, and Germany is where the Renaissance and the classical music starts. Because you've got to remember, if you play the wrong tones, you go to jail. So in Germany, with Martin Luther in, all of a sudden the rules are gone. So now you have Mendelssohn and Bach. Like Bach is like, you know, Pi City, Phi City. I mean, these guys, these classical musics, are using sacred geometry and converting it into music. Now, there is still punishment by the church. You know, they're still punishing, for example, the Templars were all burned, you know, they killed them all. And so they're still punishing this old knowledge and they have to hide it. But they're hiding it in their architecture and they're hiding it in their music. Sacred geometry is classical music. And you'll find like Beethoven's teacher was the master of Scion, you know, in um, Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code, the big master, you know. That was, and, and um, Claude Debussy was the master of Scion. So in the, in the, in, in, in the classical period, you find um, the rules being broken, and then the music comes in first. Like, first comes in the Trilly Frilly Mendelssohn and Haydn, and then comes in the Victorian... Um, trilly frilly dress and architecture. Music comes in first, always. That vibration comes in, the art follows, the architecture follows, the thought follows. In reading Theosophy, which is um, mystery school in the 1800s, they say that like 
the this is the masters that they were kind of analyzing, um, being proud the fact that they were able to use music and overlight musicians to bring people out of the dark ages and the and the middle ages, um, and that they did that with the beauty and the math, but that they were felt that people had more beautiful appearance and cold hearts, and so they said that they overlit Beethoven with compassionate music. I don't know. I mean, I'm very affected by music, but I can just sob away at Moonlight Sonata by Beethoven. And after Beethoven is no, first charity. No charities on record prior to Beethoven. None. And, you know, it's the same thing with Claude Debussy. Claude Debussy was very refined, very feminine music. All of the societies, the English, the poetry, the rights for women after Debussy. So what the Ascended Masters do is that they overlight a vibratory pattern of music and then the consciousness follows. And it's kind of nice. I'm lucky that way because I receive music the same way. It's like a big cosmic plagiarism. You just, you just hear it and then you play it. <laughs> and then you claim it as your own even though you just copied it. But um, <laughs> not too hard. <laughs> Um, and but they, what they're doing is that they're putting different patterns. They're taking um, humanity to the next step. And um, let me see. So then, as you go through the even the classical music, as you get towards the end of the classical period, it gets very dissonant. Again, thank you. The ascent. I'll try to hurry up. So we have questions. The ascended master said that they allowed some dissonant music because they said some people were so hard and crusty and it was so hard to get to their hearts that if you had a beautiful refined melody and they're kind of vibrating like this that it's like it wouldn't touch them you know they were too far gone to be um, to be able to listen to anything like this you know you'd rather have vanilla ice or something you know so um, and what they said was that they used the dissonant music to, to, to knock and shatter people's um, crusty um, emotional body fields Okay, and so, of course, the classical music is all built on a system of threes. And, of course, rock music would say is twos, melodies. Your jazz is definitely twos. It, it has a two pattern in it. And then we come to today with rap music, which is a pattern of one. It's not only a pattern of one and da-da-da-da-da-da-da, but that's the beat. So rhythmically plus um, tonal, it, it like involves man to the, pe to the pe epitome of duality into experiencing individuality and you know being all alone for good or for worse and so what I've done in my music and my books and I've got to explain this one this one is ancient sounds as an overview of 14 different methods of healing with sound like to change your brain waves to change your chemicals in your body and lots of easy different ways but at any rate um, so as you can see through the ages, sound was used as we involved, spirit involved in the matter. And my whole premise is, then you can use it backwards, and you can go by it real fast. And so I would like to entertain questions. Okay. Hi. I play an angel harp that's been retuned to a higher vibration, and supposedly an angel on each harp, Holy Spirit, whatever. Um, I'm just wondering how this all fits in because I play at the hospice and I, I can tell the person's soul just by playing it because it plays different for each person. Okay. And I'm just wondering if you know anything about this. Okay, the question is about angel harps and their tunings and their impact on people. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, let me say that any being, any ascended master is going to have a composite frequency just like everybody else in this room. So if we think of Archangel Michael, we think of blue. If we think of Jesus, we think of gold. If we think of Buddha, we think of green. And so uh, another way of saying the exact same thing is Archangel Michael's, you know, a B. And Jesus is an E. And Buddha's an F. So when you have angel harps, one thing is that they could be tuned to the angel's composite vibration. And there's different types of vibrations. The second thing is you said you played at hospice. In hospice, when you're trying to um, let a soul go and leave its body, you don't want to have invigorating music. It's very important in hospice to play an instrument like a harp 
because a harp has a, a smooth harmonic pattern. I mean, think of this. You're not going to want the brass band. You know, you're not going to want a violin either because the violin tears at your heartstrings and kind of engages you back in. So I would say your music is very much um, attuned to angelic energies and helping with people pass. Oh, they change. They, they can be so afraid. Just up tight. By the time I leave, I can tell you all kinds of stories. Feel their hands. They see visions. It's just, it's wonderful. The other thing is that angels and sended masters can carry their frequencies on tones. In my CDs, I'm a channel, and so I channel Ascended Masters and Angels, and I, I found by mistake, <laughs> if my inventions are mistakes. Anyway, I had the recording equipment on when um, I, before I started to channel, because I channel a lot, I recognize who's coming in. I can feel them before I start to speak. And so I had them recorded, and I found later I could listen to a silent track right before someone came in, and I could identify who I was channeling. So I put in Sender Masters and Angels in my, in my um, CDs. But they can, it's like, think of uh, sound as like a telephone wire. And yes, there's sound, but you have meaning, and you can put your emotions and your feelings can go right on your voice through that telephone wire. Okay, any other question? When you said the like, graph is one, is that why we're seeing so much more selfishness and things like that? It's all about me, or is that yes. tied to being yes. too simplistic? No, okay. no, not at all. Not at all. Okay. Mine's not a question so much as a sort of mental observation I made with the rap music thing since she brought it up. Was It's interesting that rap music lyrics are the only music that really the artist tends to be talking about themselves. Constantly. Yes. <laughs> yes, they do. And I think that's part of the way of um, releasing their pain. You know, it's like <coughs> ultra cathartic, I hope. Either that. See, music... Another thing I, I didn't have time to go into, but music has like a duality to it. Um, just like impatience and patience are two sides of one coin. It's the same, it's the positive and negative pole of the same vibration. Um, music is the same way. It can lead to anger for rage or it can lead to self-confidence. You know, it can lead to green for um, health and abundance, it can also lead to green for envy and greed. So it's like all of music has like a positive and negative pole. So you are the master musicians because you can listen to the music and pull out the positive or negative pole within the music. So you are a part of the miracle. More? Yeah? Can you talk a little more about your CDs? Um, you were saying that Stardust uh, was about the frequencies in the or had frequencies in the elements, and I was kind of interested in that whole Motorola. Oh, okay. Okay, the question was about um, the Stardust. Or just talk more about your CDs. The CDs in general? Okay, real quick. Stardust is balancing astrological energies, and the ancients felt there was a magnanimous benefits in doing this by balancing with the stars. I, um, you know, I'm just being creative. The stars have carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. That's primarily what's your elements in your body. So I tune with those frequencies as well. Just me being creative. Um, Paint Your Soul has Fibonacci, the spirals found in nature. It has the phi, and it has the solfeggio tones. Um, a lot of people tell me when they sleep with this um, that they, it, it helps them to kind of find their path after a while. Um, then, let me see, we have the Healing Flower Symphonies. The Healing Flower Symphonies are the Bach Flower Remedies. I picked the Soul Flowers because he said that if, this is Bach, um, that these 12 flowers um, pretty much take care of your emotional body and it's catharsis and the building of the positive oh and I forgot thank you for mentioning I forgot this one since I do all these different mystery schools and I'm the sound lady um, each mystery school is a different way of tuning your chakras with colors sounds elements um, frequencies um, rhythm patterns da 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 so I have 17 methods to to your chakras this is not music this is a guided meditation but I have the sounds that accompany 
the chakra clearing, like I have the sounds of the organs because they're related to the chakras, for example. So I have all the sounds related to chakra clearing embedded. And then I have two books, one on secret sounds, and this is Sherry Edwards' work and how to see the sounds in your body and your voice and how to balance and heal them and how to use your voice as a targeted tool. And Ancient Sounds, which has like 14 different ways. It's more of an overview, how to um, uh, heal, heal your brain waves, how to hear your emotions, how to hear your body, different ways that are fairly inexpensive and easy to use. Where's your book then? Uh, 723 in the other section. Anything else? Do you have an explanation inside of like once I buy it? Yes. It would be easy to understand how I'm to use it and... Yes. Often. Yes. Okay. Yes. I just want to make a comment uh, confirming something you said. Um, are you familiar with Gordon Michael Scallion? He does a lot of uh, research on um, earth changes, future earth changes, and he's had visions and dreams about it. But he had one particular experience. He was speaking with some spirit guides. I can't remember he was in a trance or dream state. It didn't really matter. But he was saying that he was shown by these guides that in ancient civilizations on Earth, that they didn't have a word language like we have. Their language mm-hmm. was more based on sound. Yes. It communicated yes. through different frequencies yes. of sound and mm-hmm. not literal verbiage. Like That's how the ancient Egyptians came up with their language. That's called the languages of light. They were kind of like that. That was first, languages of light, ancient Egyptian and... And then down to present. Sound or tone, a whole lot of information that can be conveyed when we have a long string of words. Yes. Thank you. 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 Thank you.